From the classroom to the emergency room, OR and beyond, you're joining Trauma ICU Rounds with your host, Dr. Dennis Kim. Welcome back to Trauma ICU Rounds. I'm your host, Dr. Dennis Kim, and I am so excited about today's episode. We are interviewing Dr. Bilal Joseph, who's a a good friend, a fantastic trauma surgeon, academician, and all around just fantastic guy. Dr. Joseph completed his residency at Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit, Michigan, followed by a surgical critical care fellowship at the R. Adams Cowley Shock Trauma Center in Baltimore, Maryland. Bilal holds numerous leadership appointments and roles. He's the Martin Gluck Professor of Surgery at the University of Arizona in Tucson. He's also the Chief of General Surgery as well as Trauma and Acute Care Surgery at U of A Tucson. Of course, Bilal holds numerous leadership positions across all of our key organizations nationally and internationally. Dr. Joseph has authored over 325 peer-reviewed publications and 30-plus book chapters. Further, his research has been funded by the National Institute on Aging, the DOD, as well as DARPA. His areas of expertise encompass TBI, transfusions, and factor replacement in trauma patients, as we'll hear a little bit later, frailty, as well as diversity, equity, and inclusion. He's a fantastic mentor, person, surgeon, an all-around great guy. We're super excited to have him on Trauma ICU Rounds. Let's take a listen. For those of our listeners, students, and residents who are just starting out in their surgical careers, tell us a little bit about frailty. What Should we be applying this to every patient who comes in through the trauma bay, or is it only for people who have white hair over the age of 65? Yeah, it's a, it's a very loaded question, but I appreciate it. You know, at first, I think you have to identify the problem, right? And and as a trainee, you know, we would go through times, and I'm sure you remember this, where people would be like, oh, this patient's 85. We're not going to do anything anymore. This patient's 70. We're, we're not going to offer surgery. Or they can't, you know, and, and we watched patients die because of their age. And we withheld, I wouldn't say intentionally or unintentionally. I mean, I just think our understanding of the disease. And so it really triggered in our minds, like, what does this all mean? And, and, and what is the problem? I mean, when you think about geriatric or elderly trauma, you know, trauma systems were built for bleeding. We all went into it for this bleeding, sick, gunshot, you know, That's and now all of a right. sudden, well, that's not what we're seeing. And a third of our patients are, are over the age of 65. And every day, 10,000 people turn over the age of 65. And any trauma center, if you take an average, more than half of our patients really are in this age group. And so now we're learning to, but as it started developing and becoming more uh, real to what we were experiencing, you know, one of the things we went, I started learning about frailty. And, you know, this came from the geriatricians of the nineties. And actually one of the Canadians, you know, uh, Ken, Ken Rockwood. And, and then there was a Hopkins geriatrician uh, who, uh, Linda Freed, who both had been writing. And so I was like, I what this is like in our world. And so, you know, when I first brought it forward, my mentors at the time were like, ah, you're crazy. You just take the thumbs up, you thumbs down, you look at them, you know, and they actually love that stuff. And, and what you learn is, is, you know, age is irrelevant to a certain degree. I mean, at some point when you're 85, 90, it, it exists, right? But what about the 65 year old? How can you tell the difference? And, and I think, that's what frailty has done for us. It's really objectified, allowed us to determine, not by guessing, not by the, I mean, you know, the very extremes, but what about those people that live in the middle that are pre-frail or Absolutely. maybe just right on their bed? And it's, and so, you know, age is important, but really the frailty status has been, I mean, the most objective, I think, uh, score that has allowed us in every field, not just trauma, to basically put our patients into, hey, put the red light on here when you decide to operate. Put the red light on here if you're admitting to the floor of the ICU. Put the red light on here. And I think, and and so we continued, you know, we started just, hey, what is frailty and trauma? And we, you know, it's, you know, if you use the Canadian Ken Rockwood 50, 50 questions, I don't know how many surgeons want to do 50 questions. And, and we took it from that level, but we did that in the beginning and people don't remember that, but that's where we started. And you know, Linda Freed's is like more like, you know, grip squeeze and walking, but our patients can't do those things. So there's deficit accumulation or, and so I think frailty, if I had to sum it up, it's your physiological, not your chronological body and your bodies. And and the one other word I just want to throw in there is, is, is your resilience, your ability to bounce back. And, and it's except, so frailty is accelerated aging in my mind with, with the 
with the decreased resilience. And when we identify those patients, now we don't say, oh, we can't do it. But maybe we can do things and focus a little bit more because we don't have the resources to do all those things. So that's how I see it. I got tired of watching patients, watching us bias patients. I mean, we were just talking about systemic bias. I mean, geriatric triage, if you look at it, especially female geriatric patients, they, they under triage them at a rate of like almost 40%. And so it's all there. And now what this has done, I don't care what frailty score you use, you know, you need to, you need to understand your patient because there's consequences. to when you do decide to manage these patients in certain ways. And again, I think uh, some of the emphasis here, folks, is that we don't want to focus in on chronologic age. And we all see patients who come in and they're a good 90. You know, they're still at home. They're doing all their own ADLs and IADLs. They're sharp as a whip. And they're going on walks and doing their own grocery shopping. And then we have 30-year-olds with, you know, end-stage liver disease due to, you know, excessive alcohol use and, and all the other sort of comorbidities that are associated with it. Can, can I just add one thing, you know, <clears throat> I'm from the Midwest. And so I grew up east of the Mississippi. When I moved to Tucson, I'm like, Oh, people come here to die. You know, this is where you retire. <laughs> and honestly, it was, it was, a, it was shocking to me when I got my first, you know, 70 year old biking down a hill at 60 miles an hour or hand gliding or mountain climbing. And I'm like, people aren't coming here to die. They're coming here to live. And, you know, and then dealing with these patients is a little different than the 20 year old or 25 year old we used to deal with. And that was, that was one of the things that, that, that made me also kind of come this way. Like, Hey, look, this is, this is bigger than, than we really understand. And our systems, I mean, the future will, we're changing our systems to deal with what we're, you know, this, this whole thing. Yeah. When I think about trauma research, especially uh, geriatric trauma research, I, I can't help but think of some of the early work by Dr. Scalia looking at the, you know, insertion of pulmonary artery catheters into elderly patients and showing a, a survival benefit. I mean, obviously we're not doing that uh, these days, but I think one of the things that some of the older research highlighted was that we can in fact have good outcomes in elderly patients and severe trauma or injury in this particular patient population is not a death sentence. Yeah. So when it comes to frailty, obviously there are a lot of different tools out there, a number of different assessments and surveys. And, and you mentioned, obviously we don't have time to go through a 50 or 75 point questionnaire. So what are you using objectively in the trauma bays or in your ICU to assess frailty? So we have the trauma specific frailty index. It's a deficit accumulation, 15 points. You ask the questions, the number of def you, you add it up, divide it by 15, and that kind of tells you if they're non frail, frail, or pre frail. Uh, every trauma admission at our institution has a frailty. It took seven years, wow. but you know, finally people started paying attention. And, and you know, and, and now we're trying to implement it. And we just are working. Uh, I, I think that finally the ACSCOT is going to have best we updated the best practices for geriatric trauma patients. And I think the recommendation is going to be that they're going to need, you need to do frailty. And, you know, when I met Ken Rockwood, which was just such an honor and, uh, you know, you read all his work and then you get to meet him and you're like, ah, you know, and, you know, in his institution, he's in the ED and he's doing it right there. I mean, I think that's, I think the earlier, the better. And, you know, there's new devices where you can just put a monitor on to help you determine these things. But, but I think the earlier, the better, because, once you identify that frail, that's like putting a tag on someone saying, listen, whatever we do, failure to rescue, complications, operations, fluid, we need to be a little bit more cautious to this patient. And I think that's how we're utilizing it in our center. Uh, you know, you did mention Dr. Scalia. I can't go without saying, you know, he was my mentor and he's just a phenomenal. I always ask the questions, why, why? And I, yeah. I think I've carried that. And Peter Reed was another one. But, but to that point, you know, when we talk about resuscitation and we talk about, you know, we did a paper, which I think is interesting because how does this apply to trauma? We looked at just, you know, blunt and penetrating uh, thoracotomy patients. And, you know, do you know how many patients uh, in the, in the blunt trauma over the age of 65 survived in T-quip over a two year analysis? Maybe a handful. You know, zero. And that's, yeah. that's what I'm saying. We were doing things to elder patients without thinking of them different than our young, you know, and you come from a super busy, you know, high volume penetrating, center where you guys are doing this complex stuff. I mean, we need to start thinking very differently about MTP in the elderly, 
management in the L. That's not happening. There's no standard. There's kind of like an application of what we do, but there's no standard. So, so I hope you know. I think that's kind of where I, I, I see all of this uh, playing around. The, the COT has certainly done some great work in terms of standardizing specific assessments among trauma patients, whether that's screening for domestic violence. PTSD, as well as alcohol and substance use. So this is seems to be a, another important area. And you mentioned the term failure to rescue. And, and this is a concept that's been looked at quite a bit. I know you and your group have written several papers, whether that's at your own institution or using TQIP. But for our listeners, what does failure to rescue mean? And how does frailty or the frailty index play into identifying patients who might be at risk for this particular process or outcome? So as we get graded in life, you know, there's these hospital systems that are going to start grading us as surgeons, as employees, you know, they always look at surgeon level factors. And so just to answer your question, failure to rescue is when someone has a admission to the hospital and then develops a complication from surgery or whatever, our ability to bring that to, to save that patient from dying from their pneumonia, their UTI, their, their re-bleed, re whatever it may be, that's that's called rescue. Failure to rescue means that we weren't able to save them from the complication that happens after surgery. And so systems, their quality of a system is because it takes a lot. To, that rescue is not just about the surgeon or the service. You know, IR, ICU care, nursing care, it's, it's, a, it's a bigger picture. And it's always been about the system level factors that impacted rescue. You know, so when we think about failure to rescue, you know, I was like, well, maybe there's patient level factors. Maybe the, maybe there's some patients we can't rescue. Like, you know what I mean? No matter what we do. Yeah. And so we we just looked at this, you know, frailty and, and rescue and saw that. I mean, I think it was I don't remember the exact number, but I think seven times more likely to fail to rescue a frail patient than a non-frail patient. Identical injuries. I, and this is, you know, I know this is trauma ICU rounds, but, you know, we do EGS, two emergency gel surgery. Absolutely. Care surgery, and we applied it to both patient populations and, and our ability to rescue. And that was the first time that we linked a patient level. They walk in the door with a patient level factor that. You know, that now when they grade and say, oh, look at Joseph, he's got four deaths. You know, all four of my patients were frail and I could actually justify a little bit of not justify, but I could actually document and show that, OK, no matter this person, based on the data we have, had, you know, seven times more likely to fail the rescue, even if we did everything perfect. And so I think right. that's where, you know, I think that's where failure to rescue is an important metric. And it's an important to understand not just system level doctor level, nurse level, but also patient level factors. So. A really important concept. And I think we see this being applied across surgical specialties. And again, like you mentioned, especially with our emergency general surgery patients, we know that this is a specific subset of surgical patients coming in with a constellation of different disease processes, but they really are unique. And so being able to identify patients who are at risk for complications may potentially change how we manage them or where we dispo them from the ER. And then again, we want to think about maybe getting our geriatricians or IM colleagues on board to help co-manage these patients. So at your shop, uh, Bilal, you have a patient coming in following, let's say, a blunt polytrauma. They're 65 years old, and we don't have much by way of comorbidities. You do your frailty uh, assessment, and the patient is indeed pre-frail or frail. How does that change your overall management at uh, your shop? Yeah, so, so you know, uh, I, I do want to, you mentioned geriatrician, geriatric council. We're unclear still. I mean, for the young listeners out there, if you want to study something and answer questions we don't know, this is the world to walk into. There, there's a right. lot of smart people out there that have done a lot of work in a lot of great areas, but this area has still got a lot of room. We don't know. Like, there's, you know, there's 1,300 trauma surgeons in the United States probably a thousand geriatricians. There's not enough to go around of each. And so we need to learn to integrate principles and learn how to be geriatricians ourselves. Um, you know, at our shop, you know, we, we just, we've had a hard time over the years to get geriat geriatricians on board you know, because they're doing so much in the outpatient world, but inpatient, you know, the geri ortho stuff that's for hip fractures, there's no doubt it makes a huge difference. Right. For sure. So we, we just implemented a new protocol um, where we're looking at, if you're over the age of 80, you automatically get a geriatric counselor. 
If you're over the age of 65 and you're frail, you get a geriatric consult. Now, once you, you know, we have, um, once every patient is identified as frail, once they're identified as frail, you know, we're doing a little bit more of a um, geriatric review. Our system is an age-friendly health system, and we're looking at the four M's, which is like mobility, medications, mentation. Um, I don't remember the fourth one, but, no, you know, I, I think it's, that's kind of what we're doing is we're focusing. And, and we're not at the point where we need to be. I'll be honest with you. Like, you know, eventually I see us having, you know, geri- like if you look at the emergency room medicine world, the stuff they do, they have geriatric-specific leveled um ERs where the patients come in, the nurses are trained a certain way, the physicians, the therapists. So we're working toward developing a more Jerry friendly um, environment. The other thing that we do, there's a frailty post-op clinic where patients follow up, not seven, you know, you come in with two rib fractures, you discharge them, they follow up in seven to 10, you know how that works yeah. or that every patient has a thing discharge, but actually we're, we're implementing changes in our, uh, discharge, earlier follow-up, earlier thing. And then the other thing we do, we're, which we're just creating, which is really exciting, and, and thanks to my two partners, Dr. Tanya Anand and Dr. Adam Nelson, we now have a early recovery, an EROS geriatric pathway. Oh, wow. Where we've implemented some of the geriatric principles, you know, early Foley removal, NG2 removal, sleep and I mean, labs, all this stuff has been, and it's a lot of work, you know, and a lot of times, you know, who should be doing this? And we as surgeons are so busy, we want to go, but it's hard for us to sit there and do a beers criteria. Right. Doing, and we're doing delirium on the floor, delirium. And, and so there's a lot of little things we're doing, but I think it's going to take time to develop the entire system. And I see us eventually having just like a burn ward or an ICU or a peds ward. You know, we, we need a geriatric ward with nurses and therapists and physicians who see those patients, pharmacists, in a very different light. Cause right now they're just put on the list of 50 or 70 that we all have. And you round on them and you make decisions and how often are we really changing? And that's, that's where we need to figure this out. And it's not, I'll tell you the one other thing I've learned a lot about frail. And one of the questions we asked was it's not just inside the hospital. You know, these patients are different when you discharge them. And right. Recur- as simple as a, you know, recurrence of falls, recurrence of trauma. I mean, loss of independence how much do we struggle just talking about our ability to say you lived alone you've been falling it's your third fall we can't and then they tell you well i don't have anyone i'm by myself i mean this is a big social problem which we never even talk about so true but i think you know recovery at rehab we look i mean when you take all the things that we try to take frailty and it's just amazing how it's just over and over that if you're frail if you're on that side of the scale as a patient and, and you can fix frailty. That's the other thing. Like you, you know, little things, you can make a difference, but it's, it's a bigger problem. And I think it's not just the patient and the medical care, but like even the social care after where do they go? Who's following up? Are they doing, you know, do they have the things they need? How do they go from completely independent to dependent dry? I mean, there's so much, there's so much still to do. You bring up some really, really interesting ideas and concepts. And I love the idea of an ERAS or enhanced recovery after surgery, specifically for frail or elderly patients. And I think it's something that, like you said, we've got 50, 60 patients and we're kind of just flying through rounds, just trying to, you know, keep the the ship afloat. And sometimes we, it's hard to find the time to dedicate to, to really inquire into someone's social history and their functional status and really get to, to form a bond or get to know these patients. And the other, the other idea of having a geriatric specific area in the hospital, I think is absolutely fantastic. I mean, as you say it, I'm kind of thinking to myself, uh, yeah, obviously, you know, we have pediatric wards, we've got a NICU, we've got like specialty specific units. Yet when an elderly patient with multiple comorbidities, who's frail on blood thinners, you know, who's kind of pre dementia gets admitted, they're just, on the regular ward with the young kid who's just been shot and, you know, the post-op appy. Look, look at the trauma bay, right? We are our highest level activation. Is, we call it trauma red, right? The trauma red, just based on GCS, you know, if you get an 80 year old ground level fall and it's a trauma red, you got 35 people probably standing in, around from therapy to this, to the case. How many of them are trained in the management of geriatric? 
you do the same thing for a Pete's patient. Oh. You know, the pick you come down, pick you nurses, special things. We got special instruments, you know, I mean, the <laughs> uh, the Braslow's out, the doses of medications are already drawn up. Yeah, it's a luxury. Everyone's pushing this, this CBA, you know, instead of ABCDE of trauma. There's like, everyone's talking about, I think there needs to be, you know, a G, A, B, C, D, E of trauma. And I, we can skip the F, but we definitely need a G in that A, B, C, D, E. And I think that will be the future. But Again, you know, I think I, the good news is I think it's gaining light. I think we're learning. I think we've now identified and we're continuing to identify. And we don't have enough resources or finance right now. And not just us. I mean, nationally, I think this is a big problem. And so that's why I think another area where frailty helps you. Because what if you identify the pre-frail? What if you identify the not, you know, the frail or the, even the non-frail? Now you can say, okay, I only have X amount of resource. I'm going to utilize it on my pre-frail group. I'm going to use it on my frail group. You know, I'm going to only have my frail people follow up. And that's and that objectifies really without doing the, what I call the thumbs up test. You know, right. it, it objectifies our ability to make that decision better. Well, kudos to you and your group to be able to implement this sort of screening in the trauma bay. I can imagine uh, we all know this uh, change takes time, especially culture change. And so you have to be, um, you know, stubborn and you have to persevere and you have to convince people that this is the right thing to do because it will impact patient and family outcomes. So that's absolutely fantastic. And again, I need to emphasize this because I'm getting so many ideas here. I'm already thinking about my next study. And so for the young researchers out there, this is fire. This is gold. Cool. Okay, what you're hearing from Dr. Joseph. And so if you're looking for an area that you want to develop an expertise in and develop your brand, I'm telling you, this is an area ripe for research and further investigation. Can I add just two more things uh, before? I don't know Please. If topic or what, but I just want to add two more things. I think one, I think to your point, when you put your hand out there as a surgeon, as a trauma surgeon and look for colleagues and collab, I mean, Dr. Mindy Fain's a geriatrician here at our institution. She's been my mentor for seven years. The National Institute of Aging, the geriatric, American Geriatric Society, the, the pathway, the funding, there's so much resource going into training non-geriatricians into geriatric care that if you want to follow that pathway and get become part of that, I mean, there is so much resource for you to do that. I just think from the national level, it's really important to talk about just two quick things about geriatric. Where, you know, now we have the ACS you know, centers of excellence for geriatrics, I think, which is coming down the line. The American College of Surgeons Committee on Trauma will have some requirements for geriatric FTEs, whether it be an APP or your service. Um, you know, I sit on the, the National Trauma Research Agenda Planning Committee. There's a whole section dedicated to geriatrics. And when we did our Delphi, there was 400 questions still unanswered wow. in, in geriatrics. And so that, you know, it's it's hot, it's there. And then and then the last thing, you know, with the, we're working with the Coalition of National Trauma Research uh, to develop a geriatric trauma research network. So when you do do your studies and then you want to take it to a national level, you know, you can actually uh, have a network that's focused on the geriatric to answer these questions. I mean, we're doing a double AST frailty MIT right now. We have 15 centers. Okay. Once we get that data, you know, where do we take it from there? And that's the interventional side. And not, I'm going to tell you right now, you mentioned gold. I mean, platinum or diamond is, is the interventions. What are we going to, what, what works? And that, and that is fun because it keeps you clinical. It keeps your mind and what you're doing and your patients. And you can go from there and, and, and change what we are as we think is medical. So when we think about interventions, obviously that's coming down the pipeline, but what are you doing right now? So you get a patient who's frail, they're going to be at risk for things like delirium in hospital. So what are some of the key things that just right when we're done this interview, what can I do when I identify a patient who's frail? What should I be doing to prevent complications and hopefully improve outcomes in this patient population? You know, I, I really think it's the, it's the pre-frail group. I don't know if it's the frail group yet because I think we're going to need something. <clears throat> I mean, like delaying, you know, how many biliary colics do you see? Or how many, you know, how many times, you, you know, like I really, you know, the types of medicine you're giving these patients, stuff that surgeons don't want to talk about, you know, how are we, you know, how much Robaxin do you give for rib fractures? You know, you talk to, you know, but, but to answer your question, I think one is one, you need to change the way we, we round on them. That's number one. I think we need to focus on some of the other aspects and, and, you know, a geriatric assessment is important. You need to do a geriatric assessment. 
uh, I think to, to, that helps with the two, you got to screen for delirium. Uh, I think that's another thing, which may not only be linked to, to frailty, but we've had plenty of studies that show frailty is linked to delirium as an independent factor, again, with comorbidity sure. and with, and remember, frailty is not comorbidities and with multiple medications. I think, um, you know, uh, having a team of non-physicians, whether it be therapists, pharmacists, where you round maybe once or twice when you bring them by just these patients. I think, And then the follow-up has to be different, whether it be through their PCP or into your clinics. I, I think we need to, to do those things. I think that's that's what I would say right now. Uh, you know, non-op management when we can when we can do it, operative management when it's needed. I mean, we just did another study that looked at, you know, our happy patients who were frail, whether we should manage them conservatively or not. And and the reality is, is maybe we should be getting the disease out of them sooner because they when you discharge them, they come back the second time with worse complications, with inability to recover, that whole resilience pathway that we were talking about. And and then the other side of this is, is let's say you see a hernia that reduced in a frail patient and that you know eventually is going to need to be fixed or whatever. You know, you could prehab, you know, a little bit of, I mean, you look at like the studies on prehab, walking and exercising. Right. I, always, I always have a slide of like Arnold Schwarzenegger doing like versus a little guy you know, <laughs> drinking some Coke on a treadmill. And, and the reality is you don't need a lot, you know, two to three weeks of just walking and doing some of those things will help change our patients and their ability to recover. And so I think that's, that's what I, if I had to put some work therapists, you know, we're doing fall prevention. I mean, prevention is another thing I didn't even mention. What can you do right now? I think prevention is another huge thing. You need to go to, you know, make sure that you have these home evaluations for patients who are falling, the Tai Chi, the fitness, that stuff is very, it seems like, oh yeah, whatever. But it, that, like, it's hard for us to put those things and implement them, but that's what we really need to start working with. Yeah. So it sounds like having a multimodal, multidisciplinary approach and really uh, getting up to speed in terms of what the specific issues are that our elderly patients or frail patients uh, may be faced with. You know, it's so interesting, uh, Bala, whenever I see an elderly male patient come in and, you know, ground level fall on blood thinners and you ask him, you know, why are you on warfarin? Oftentimes they can't tell you or what are the meds are you on? And as soon as their spouse or partner shows up, they've got a, a nicely printed list of all the medications and the last doctor's visit. You, you flip it and you have an elderly woman come in and their their partner's there. It's like they have no freaking idea. <laughs> it just, you know, I just it's so funny time and time again. Yeah, you know, um, so some of this hits home too. you know, my parents, my dad's 80. My mom's in their like early 70s. Both of them had cardiac bypass surgery within a month of each other. And, you know, and wow. he was back in Toledo. But, you know, I, as an academic minded, you know, in this world and you go back and it's not just our institutions, you know, it's our, you know, you go out there and see, we have a lot of work to do beyond. And, and to your point, like my dad, you know, didn't know. And why did he do this? I don't know why. And, and my mom's like, <laughs> it's kind of funny to say that, but, 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 you know, you know, you, they, they were going to, you know, give my dad uh, a benzo one night because, you know, and you just hear these things and it's like, you know, and you're like, what? you know, and, and, but what, what about the patients who don't have the advocates and the patients who don't have the people to, to stand? Right. Up? And I think, so what we're going to learn it in our systems, but we also have to disseminate it into, you know, most trauma patients falls don't come to level one trauma centers. And, you know, but they may need to, you know, and that's, that's, the side. that's, that's what we're redesigning. So on a related topic, uh, on the topic of your research endeavors and frailty, and you just mentioned the need to come to a level one trauma center and be seen by specialists, another big area that you and your group have worked on is traumatic brain injury. And I'd imagine when we're talking elderly trauma or trauma in the geriatric population, hip fractures and TBI kind of go hand in hand. And so for those listeners who maybe aren't familiar with the brain injury guidelines, I really feel like this has been a really important advancement in our fields, especially for those of us who may not be at a level one trauma center or have immediate access to neurosurgery. Maybe elaborate upon big, where were we and where are we? Where are we going? 
change is hard. <laughs> That's what I'll say. <laughs> yeah. Slow down, young Padawan. I learned that the hard way. <laughs> so, so, you know, um, I think, again, leaving, you know, Detroit and Baltimore and then coming to Tucson, a little bit more rural, a little, little out there, you start realizing resource is not the same across the country, number one. Uh, number two, you know, we would round on patients. And the first question we looked at was like, you know, repeat head CTs. I have patients getting two, three, four repeat head CTs. Why? How? And, you know, that was the first question that actually got me in, in this topic. And then the other thing I did yeah. around was an attending and in a neurosurgery, you know, standard documentation was, and, and look, this all happened with our neurosurgical colleagues. They're amazing. They, this is their specialty. They, they've helped us take this along. I just think, you know, it'd be a second year resident writing, admit to ICU, admit to ICU, repeat head scan, Q1 hour neuro checks. And then they would go in and the attending would sign, not even come by the next morning. I'm like, I don't need someone to tell me that. Like I can figure this out. And, <laughs> yeah. and when you try to change something as big as like head injury, you know, I always ask the question when I give this talk is like, if I asked if your grandma was in the hospital and I told you they had a little bit of blood in their head, like four millimeter bleed, would you want a neurosurgeon? And, you know, it's funny, the audience, everyone in the audience is like, and you, the reality is, you know, most of TBI with intracranial hemorrhage is not operative. You know, four millimeters is the quarter of the size of a pea. I mean, put that in your head. Like, it's just, you know, and, and, and not on top of that, CT scans were getting better. So we're picking up a lot more, you know, the resource, the transfers. I was up in Alaska doing some telemedicine stuff, and and I, was, and I realized, like, oh, my God, like, you know, they fly patients from Anchorage to Washington or, you know, from from Montana because there's no neurosurgeons and the number of neurosurgeons is, is shrinking and they're also increasing in age. And there was a consensus statement about this subject. So we when we initially had, I was very zealous, like, oh, we don't need to call them for anything. You know, and I'm like, that's a little too extreme. People are like, well, we don't need for it. But I think when you're going to make a change, you have to think about you can't have one error. One error will change. will stop the whole thing. Imagine that. Like. Not console, I mean, so we started out back, uh, I don't remember when, I think 12, and first looked at repeat head CTs and said, you know, how many times did we actually have an impact? And so we created these brain injury guidelines, and they're really just guidelines, you know, big one, big two, big three. And and, it, and when you look at it from a big one is like no anticoagulation, real four millimeters, isolated, no skull fracture, you know, and we're saying, and what we said is, Look, if you have this and you have to meet every single one of these criteria, you don't need a repeat. Maybe you can even go home. I mean, we would get people from right. an hour from here. They'd call us and like, oh, we have a s scattered subarachnoid. And then all of a sudden they'd show up. We repeat their scan and it was nothing. I mean, these every scan in a 25-year-old is, you know, so that, that was big one. And big three was easy too because big three is any change in neurological status, any depressed skull fracture that's – any type of bleed that is, is um, you know, on anticoagulation. And, and so it was really easy, the big one. The gray zone is the big two. That's kind of where, like, you know, what are we doing here? And, but our neurosurgeons were visionary. And, uh, and uh, you know, I got to always thank Dr. Lamal, who was our chairman at the time. And him and I talked. And he, he understood and felt that there was a need for this. And, and so big two was more on the lines of, okay, they're not ready to go home. Maybe they don't even need a repeat head scan. And again, it's just based on size and neurological state. Are they examinable? Are they on any anticoagulants? So we try to create what, what I term as a safe guideline or protocol. And, you know, big one basically said, go home. Big two said, you know, come back, get admitted, not necessarily the ICU, do neuro checks. And only if your neuro exam changes, will we repeat your scan. And then big three was the standard care. And then everyone was like, what about, you know, who's following up with these patients? Where are they coming? And, you know, if you really, we looked at that and like 20% of our patients follow up, number one. Number two, there's different models. Some go to neurology, some go to trauma, some go to, and our neurosurgeons were willing to see these patients after if we saw them in clinic and there was, you know, anything. So four, five, six, I mean, how many patients does it take to change practice? You know, 10,000 patients later and running around, finally other systems started implementing it, you know, and, and I'm going to tell you, my that my most prideful moment was when a neurosurgery resident from, I forget where, I'm not going to name, but, you know, sends me an email. I was like, hey, th you know, this is so right. Like, can we, and, you know, we can't get in. I'm just like, yeah, I'm not going to ever forward your email. But, but that's, you know, <laughs> it's still that, that notion of, of being afraid to just, what made us think that we needed to call neurosurgery for 90% of the non-op. We're managing them in our ICU, critical care, neurocritical care. That's what we do, trauma critical care. And so a lot of times the neurosurgeons were signing, I mean, we manage these patients and then we work with our neurosurgical colleagues. It's integration. And so I think that's, 
But we've shown that we reduced, I mean, repeat head CTs, IC, I mean, ICU stay by like 60%. Just in big, if you look at big one alone, forget two and three for a second. If you just look at big one, the number of repeat head CTs and the number of ICU admissions that we've reduced is just, I mean, I've never done a cost analysis on it, to be honest with you, which I should. But I would love to see that. Yeah, it's unbelievable. It's, it's ridiculous. And then now we walk around our units now. We don't, I mean, I hear things like people who are in anticoagulation, who have a negative scan, who are getting two, three, four repeat. I mean, we even wrote the paper on greater than one repeat head CT, that unless you had a neuro change and never did anything. And, right. And, and so it was more about the patient and our ability to streamline the process. And I'll be honest, it took us almost a year at our own institution back in 12 to do it. Now the ED doesn't even call neurosurgery. It's been implemented. I mean, I know I have colleagues uh, David Skarupa at Jacksonville and, and Marty Schreiber, I think, has implemented some of it up in, in – and there's been a lot of centers that have implemented it already. And in Ohio, I know they um, – uh, Dr. Goodman took it and put it at a level three and used it for tran- triage transfer criteria, and they've actually implemented it across the state for transfer criteria. So I think wow. uh, you know, we've built it and we started it. We finally got people thinking about it. Now it's time for another young – Hungry whoever <laughs> surgeon to go out there and actually, you know, improve it, make it better. Maybe we don't need to be giving seizure medication. Maybe we don't need to, you right. know, transfer these patients who are non-operative bleeds that are big ones or big two. So that's kind of where we're trying to go with it right now. But and, and you know, it didn't come easy. There was a lot of neurosurgeons who told me that I was ruining the world. And you know, and, <laughs> but but I think I congrats to I I pre, you know it was hard to get it published. It was hard to get people to even believe this and. Wow. This is another one I think that we're not there yet, but here at our institution, big is normal. So, but I tell my residents and my students all the time, I'm like, listen, in a lot of places, this patient goes to the ICU, gets a repeat scan, you know, but we need to get away from that. Breaking the dogma of something that has never been proven that we needed to do is so hard. Like when people are like, tell me, right. you know, I'd be like, show me data that says that we're supposed to be doing this. You know, this is the opposite, but because it was the right. standard, that's what we have to do. So, that's kind of where we are with big. I think, uh, again, it's, I think it's, it's important and it's, it's great for the, I think the next level of big is transfer protocols beyond the level one. Yeah. I can't even count the, the number of times we get a call from our transfer center for a patient with a ditzel, you know, on their head, following some low risk mechanism fall, not on blood thinners. GCS is 15. And uh, fortunately, we've been able to make some changes in terms of where they get dispo to. So if they've got a good GCS or don't have any high risk features, they can go to a regular ward bed versus occupy an ICU bed. Uh, around these parts, though, we still do the routine repeat head CT. And, and it just kills me because there's just so much data, like you said, going back years and years from multiple different institutions showing that it's really unnecessary. One of the things I do want to highlight and emphasize, and I don't know if our listeners have picked up on this, but one of the things that I really appreciate about you, Bilal, is is you give so much credit to these other specialties and your colleagues and whether it's geriatrics or now you're talking about the the previous chair of neurosurgery. It seems like with your research and I'd imagine also in your day-to-day working life as the chief of trauma, you, you really hold your colleagues on a, on a high pedestal and you really seem to work together to solve questions and problems. Yeah. Uh, you know, you learn quickly. It's a d- difficult world, and you know, being a minority, a little imposter syndrome. I think also, you know, I learned. Oh, wow, I feel like, you, brother. I, I I learned, you know, early on. You you, lo- you know, I, I think inclusion, servant leadership is really where it's at. You need to, you know, when I went to Fane and I published with her the geriatric stuff, and she brought so much that I had thought about, and it just and same thing with neurosurgery. When I went to them, and we, and and and, and I think. Look, at the end of the day, that's that's the mission and, and teamwork makes the dream work and you're going to accomplish more. People are always challenge. I'm not afraid to change and think outside the box. And the only way that's possible is to have people around you and create a culture around you that allows it. So, you know, if you look at every one of the papers we've written, you probably find one or two out of all of them that has you know, one or two authors. It's all about inclusion and everyone contributes in their own ways at our research meetings, at our discussions, at development of the trial. And I think, I know there's a big thing about this whole ghost, you know, I know we're going off topic here, ghost authorship. No, not at all. But but the reality is, 
you know, there's so many parts to this. When you take clinical questions and you integrate them into, into research questions, you really got to give credit to the clinicians who bring right. that perspective just as much as the person who knows how to run the stats or run anything. And I'm a big believer in that. And so, and, and to, to your point, I really believe that that's the way forward is always, you know, together with, with the team. And, and So there's a couple of things that you just mentioned there that I, I want to ask you about. And one of them was imposter syndrome. And I'm not sure if everyone's really familiar with that term, but uh, that's something that I think many of us uh, struggle with, uh, especially when we have a situation clinically where maybe the outcome was less than desirable or frankly bad, and you start to question yourself. And so elaborate upon that and what have you done to kind of to deal with or manage feelings of imposter syndrome? So, I mean, just in general, it's the feeling of not really believing that what you've done is real or, I mean, and, you know, as a, I mean, but it doesn't happen just like that. It comes from years. You know, I was a foreign grad. I was a prelim surgery resident. I was never good. I didn't get into med school. I didn't, you know, when I came and took a job in Tucson, Peter didn't want to hire me until I was the last name on a list. I mean, I could go off. You know, <laughs> but I mean, you know, years and years of that belief that you were, you, it's not you. I didn't have the trajectory. I didn't have the mentors initially. And, and, you know, just tip a couple people to believe in you and show you the door. And then you had the opportunity. And I think, you know, I think it's a real thing. And, and so, you know, you asked me what I do about, I still, I mean, people are always shocked when I say that I still struggle that I'm in these circles. And am I really here? I was never, I had one paper when I left fellowship, you know, like it wasn't, this was not my destiny and, and it tastes sweeter, but at the same point, people don't understand what it's, you know, what it means. But the, the thing I will tell you that helps more than anything is the people around you. And, you know, when you have good people around, like, you know, we all go to these meetings and you just want to be part of these groups and, and you never think you are. And, and, but every once in a while, someone in those groups will, will, will talk to you and make you feel part of it or, or, or things like this, where, you know, you all the ways and you hear it, like it's, you, we need that positive reinforcement. It's important. We don't do that enough in our world. It's always, you know, talking about the opposite. And I think that's, that's the side of it. I think it's people when I, I really think it's people, it's people around you. It's surrounding yourself with and knowing, you know, who is real and really, and it's not about, you know, your accomplishments, but rather the people and the journey. Absolutely. Yeah, it's so important to surround yourself with good people. And I think the trauma community, like you mentioned, there's what, like 1300 of us in this country, it's a small community. And what I've always uh, found, especially as I'm sort of heading into my mid career now is that, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, some of the surgeons that you mentioned, someone like Dr. Schreiber, Marty, who's so accomplished, nicest guy in the world, you yeah. know, and you can just walk up to these people or any of us at a meeting and start talking. And I think uh, mentorship is so important. And the other the other concept you brought up was this notion of servant leadership. And it's so contradictory to when I think about some of my mentors in the past, it was sort of my way or the highway, you know, and this is how it is no questions asked and you just did what you had to do and put your head down and got the work done. But I don't think that style works anymore in this day and age, that sort of authoritative, my way, the highway, it's just not a thing. It's a hard one. Uh, you know, having, a, being a leader, uh, having opinions is not wrong, but sometimes right. that can be interpreted in what you just said. And a lot, a lot of time as a leader, you know, you're the lighthouse in the storm. You, you, you know, you're, you got to hold yourself, but you also are breaking down inside. And so it's just continuing to, to, to fulfill that, that inner side, but the servant leadership, you know, I tell you, I could go down a list of people I've just reached randomly reached out to how I may even just bumped into like Jim Davis at Fresno or living, you know, people I never thought would ever even know who I was. And I'd ask right. them a question or Scalia or, and just li listening to, you know, they just in a second, just opening that I need help, you know, or whatever. I have a question and it's just amazing the amount of support you're right in our community that there is. And, and I think that, you look, you look at the leaders in our country. We all pay attention. You know, growing up, like, oh, my God, I'm going to meet this person. You know, even the first time, I, you know, you, 
you read about all their work and stuff and then you meet them and everyone's human. And, and you realize though, that you look at the leaders who are able to develop and create pathways for people. You know, it's no longer about us at this point. It's about, you know, my right. ability for my, my people to go on and, and run this, um, change, change the world we practice in, as they say, that's, it's, and there's no better feeling than that. You know, no matter how much I do by myself and I'm done, it's nothing like when one of my mentees comes to me or one of my peeps and, and mentorship is not like, Oh, I got to meet with them every week. Or, it could be like a random email question, telephone, but and, and they come to you like, I did and you're just like, wow, you know, that's, that's the best feeling in the world. It really is. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Before we uh, depart, uh, Dr. Joseph, any final words? I think there's just been um, so many great words of wisdom throughout the last hour, but any parting words for our listeners? Anything that they should be thinking about or looking out for as they uh, move into their surgical careers? Yeah, I think uh, there is no magic wand. I really think hard work pays off. And I know that sounds so cliche, but at the end of the day, when you work hard, over time, that will be recognized. And if that's one thing that you're, you know, you're looking in and we talked about people, you have to balance yourself, people that you can, you know, don't bottle it up, feel free to reach out and talk. And, and, and that whole work life, it's not balance, man. It's integration. It's, you know, it's part, I bring my wife and my kid to the meetings. They know my wife knows more of the people nationally than I do because, she has a, you know, but it's, it's, it's that integration. And, and I think you got to learn what that means. And you don't, the last thing I would say is, you know, it's, it's the only person you're competing with or you're, you're, you compare yourself to is yourself. Like, don't, don't get in. I, I lived that game and I played it and I was, you know, and then you learn <laughs> and like, just look at your, what do you want? And are you enjoying what you're doing? And are you, do you wake up every single day to light the world on fire? And if you don't, then you're not doing the right thing. And I mean that, like, that's the passion you need to have because it's fun for you. It's not about, you know, the number or the outcomes or it's really more about like, like this is fun. This is exciting. And this is what, you know, drives us every day. And if someone else doesn't have these passions, it's okay too. Whatever that is, you know, enjoy it. That, that That's the bottom line. So I don't know if that makes sense, but that's kind of how I see it. And that wraps up our interview with Dr. Bilal Joseph. Thanks for tuning in. If you're enjoying the show, make sure to visit us at Apple iTunes or wherever you download your podcasts. Leave us a five-star review and a kind comment, and feel free to reach out. You can email me, DennisYoungKim at gmail.com or TraumaICUround to gmail.com. If there's a specific topic or speaker or professor you want to hear from, let us know. Until next time, stay safe, keep reading, take care of yourselves, and one another. (laughs) 